right. Hi, everybody. Oh, we have some people here already. Perfect. I'm just going to get those of you who are here already, if you could just let me know if you can hear me okay in the chat, that would be really great. Got some more people coming. Just if somebody could let me know if you can hear me. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be taking questions in the Q and A, or you could also put them in the chat. It's just a little bit more difficult to filter through, but put your questions if you have any in the Q and A, and then I'll get to them at the end. So I'm not going to be taking questions during the presentation, but I will look at them afterwards. So we're going to be doing about 40 minutes of presentation and then I'll have 20 minutes or so at the end for, for questions. So for those of you who are here already, um, we're going to start in like five minutes time, but in the meantime, if you'd like to let me know where you're from, what you're, what you're hoping to get out of the seminar, if you are a speech therapist like myself, or if you are another professional, or maybe you're a parent, just let me know so I know uh, who I'm kind of catering to today. Let's see. We'll wait just a few more minutes. Oh, special needs tutor, great. Educational consultant from St. Louis. That's really good. The time zone that we picked for this webinar was so that we could hit America and Australia. So it's gonna be Australia in the morning, America, I think um, like in the daytime, I guess. And then I'm in Europe. So it's like really late at night for me. It's like 11 p.m. right now, but that's okay. <laughs> Oh, SLP and auditory verbal therapist. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, okay, some more messages coming through. Oh, we have a grandparent. Very nice. Another speech pathologist. Perfect. Another speech therapist. That's great. I was, I was hoping we'd have some speech therapists because that's what I am. That's the topic that I can kind of speak the most knowledgeably about. Oh, and a speech uh, pathologist and learning specialist in a mental health practice. That's interesting. Very cool. Lots of people. We can get our, we'll give just a few more minutes while everyone joins. It's looking good. Oh, someone who is trained in the Tomatis method. That's really great. I'm not trained in Tomatis method. I'm just a speech therapist, but I do share clinic space with other professionals who do the Tomatis method. So I'm quite familiar with what it is, what it, how it looks. It's a really interesting method. Another speech therapist. That's great. Lots of speeches. I did the same uh, webinar yesterday. We were aiming for the European time zone and there were almost no speech therapists. It was all like um, neuropsychologists, psychologists, occupational therapists. It was everyone except speech therapists. So it's nice to have a few more of you speeches here today. Oh, teacher in New Zealand. Cool. I'm from New Zealand. I know my accent doesn't sound like it anymore. I've been away for a really long time, but that is where I'm from. just a couple of minutes. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Two people raised their hand. What can I do here? I'm not really sure what to do when people raise their hand. Sorry about this, guys. Yesterday I had someone helping me with the technical side, but today I'm all by myself. Okay. Just close this. Another speech therapist, great. Or speech pathologist, if you're from the States. Oh, yes, perfect. Thank you for that um, reminder. Um, please, everybody, when you type in the chat, can you click on all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the post. Thank you so much for that reminder. I don't have someone helping me with the technical side, so thank you so much for that today. So yeah, when you type, just, just click on all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see your message or your question or your comment, and maybe you can have a discussion amongst yourselves while I'm giving the, giving the presentation. 
All right, for those of you who have just joined, um, I've said that I am going to be taking questions at the end. Um, if you have a question that you can't wait to ask, you can pop it in the Q&A or in the chat. It's a little bit easier for me if you put it in the Q&A, just a little bit easier to filter. Um, I'll look at them at the end. I will try and filter through the chat at the end too, um, but I won't be answering them as we go, but I will have 20 minutes at the end for your questions. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Let me just share my screen with everybody. So today we're going to be talking about using forebrain um, in speech and language therapy and specifically we're going to be looking at using forebrain with children with language delays. So let's get started. So who am I? My name is Grace. Uh, I'm a speech and language therapist. I'm from New Zealand as I mentioned already. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand. I did all my training in New Zealand as a speech therapist. And then uh, I worked as a speech therapist in New Zealand for a few years, and then I moved to France. So I set up my private practice in France and I've been here for just over seven years now. I'm working mostly in early intervention. So I work with a lot of children with language delays, a lot of children with speech sound disorders and children with autistic spectrum disorder as well. And then I also work with some school age children and some adolescent children as well, but mostly in early intervention, kind of two to five years old. I was introduced to Forebrain in 2017, towards the end of 2017, and straight away I just thought it was a really interesting use of technology and I thought this could really be beneficial to some of the kids that I work with. So I started using it in December 2017, so I've been using it for about two and a half years and I really like it. I love having it as part of my therapist toolkit, so I just wanted to share with you how I use it. So to start with, we're just going to be talking about what is Forebrain. So I have mine here today. Up this little case. So it's just a wireless headset, as you see, and it's comprised of three things. So we've got our microphone, we've got our dynamic speech filter, this little box here, and then we have these little blue discs, I don't know if you can see these, that use bone conduction to send messages to our auditory nerve. So how it works is we pop it on, it sits on our head like this, See if you can see this. And so these little blue discs, they're not sitting inside our ear, they're sitting on the bone right here. If you wanna to touch your face, you have just a bone right here, that's where they wanna sit. So you've got them sitting there, and then we have the microphone about three centimeters away from our mouth or from the mouth of someone else. We can turn it and we can have it point at somebody else. So basically what happens is when speech goes into this microphone, the message is transmitted here through to the dynamic filter. The dynamic filter is um, designed so that it filters speech, so that only speech messages are gonna be sent through to the bone conduction, and then these vibrate, these bone conduction, and then our auditory nervous stimulated directly. So what ends up happening is we have like a slightly louder version of our own speech in real time. There is no delay at all. It's really spooky. It's a very curious sensation if you haven't, um, if you haven't tried it out before. So when we're thinking of this device as speech and language therapists, it falls under the category of altered auditory feedback devices. It's just something that alters the way that we hear things. So the way that this alters the way that we hear things is that it amplifies our speech in real time. It's designed to be used as a complementary tool. So it's not replacing anything that we're already doing as speech therapists. It's designed to be used to enhance the evidence-based practice methods that we're already using in practice. I'm gonna take this off. I don't need to be wearing this right now. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking about children with language delay today. And this is just basically any child who is not meeting language milestones. And they may be receptive language milestones, they may be expressive language milestones, or it could even be both. Can also include children with multiple disabilities or complex needs, like my little friend Inez in the middle over here, who's one of the boys that I work with. Just a little side note, we're not gonna be talking about speech sound disorders or autistic spectrum disorder today, but we will have future webinars on using Forbrain with those populations because it's just a little different and it's a lot of information. So we're gonna be doing webinars on those in the future. So if you have questions about those, maybe wait till the next webinar. So tips for introducing Forbrain. Well, we can pretend we're doing it right now. So got my Forbrain in its case. If I'm working with a child and I'm introducing forebrain to them for the first time, we just want to make a really fun experience and very um, low pressure. There is no 
pressure on them to wear it. It's not scary. We're just making it fun and enjoyable. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my forebrain. We're going to open it up, unzip it, look at it, take it out, let them touch it, have a look. And then I'm just going to model how I wear it first. So I'm going to show how I wear forebrain. I put it on myself. I turn it on. I show them how it looks. And then I'll also show it how it looks on a parent if I have a parent in on the session too, which I often do. So then mom or dad gets a turn. And I'm going to be using a very excited expression and very excited vocalizations just to show that this is something nice, something fun, something a little bit exciting and different. Then if I think the child is comfortable, I might take it off and say, okay, your turn. And pop it on their hand. I've got my little, my prop today. I don't have any real children at my house, so this is the best I could do. It was this or a cat, so I don't know. I feel like this doll is gonna be a little bit more cooperative. So we pop it on the child, and I always make sure that I have a mirror, or I don't have one today, I have a cell phone camera. So that's my other tip. We're gonna put it in selfie mode so that the child can see what they look like, because this is so, so fun for the child to see themselves with like a little microphone, little headset. They just love it. I've had kids say that they look like a singer, that they look like a policeman. I've even heard someone say that they look like someone from Paw Patrol. They just think it's a really fun, cool thing to see themselves wearing this fun headset with the microphone. Um, after that, I also like to take photos and videos. Again, just kind of having this fun, cool thing on their head give them a little souvenir to take home to remember what they did in therapy. Or if I'm in the home, give them a, a, a souvenir to leave with them. Sometimes though, we will work with children who are a little bit more sensitive, whether they just may, may be a bit more wary in general, or maybe they might be hypersensitive about having things around their ears or hypersensitive about noises. So these are the strategies that I will use with those types of children. The biggest one is just to take your time. We're in absolutely no rush. We have as much time as we need, no pressure for the child to wear it. The first strategy I always try is just to take turns. So it might just be enough for some children that if we're reading a book together, it might be my turn to wear the forebrain for one page. So oh, we, read our, we read our page and then, oh, it's your turn for the next page. And I'll just take it off my head, put it on their head for one page. And then as soon as that page, page is finished, turn the page, I'll pop it back on my head. So it's just this nice back and forth, taking turns, their turn is not too long. Um, the goal with taking turns is to build up their turn longer and longer and longer. So if we're reading a book, we might do one page and one page each, and then two pages, two pages, three pages, three pages, eventually maybe building up to like a whole book. For children who are even more sensitive than that, their turn might just be placing the forebrain next to them. So for example, for me, my turn is having it on my head. Okay, your turn. I'm going to take it off my head and I'm just going to place it right next to the child, maybe near their feet if they're sitting down, just next to them, near them. Afterwards, my turn again. I put it on my head. Their next turn might be in their lap, so it's touching them this time. We're just kind of slowly getting them used to the forebrain, showing that it's not scary, it doesn't hurt, it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, their turns might be on their belly, on their hands, in their shoulders, on their head, and then eventually on their ears, eventually. Doesn't have to happen in one session. Um, for kids who have a little bit more language, we can kind of play around with this. We can make it kind of funny game. I can say, okay, my turn. I'm going to put it on my ears and then your turn. Where would you like to put it? Shall we put it on your tummy or shall we put it on your shoulders and kind of give them a choice, let them make it fun and silly and just really not a big scary thing. And like I said, this may happen in one session, which is fantastic. And I definitely have had kids, which I thought it would take forever to get them to wear the forebrain. And it happened in one session, which was great. And it may happen across multiple sessions. And that's fine too. The goal is just to eventually slowly build them um, up to wearing the forebrain for longer periods of time. We're not in a rush. So the recommendations for wearing forebrain per day. For children under five, we're aiming for 10 minutes. And for children age five to 15, we're aiming for 15 minutes. Ideally, it's a 10 minute block of time. But if we can't get that, if we are taking turns with the child, we just kind of want to aim for 10 total minutes as best we can. And same for the 15 minutes for older children. Um, if we skip a day, we're not going to then double up the next day. We're just going to stick to our daily recommendation of 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depending on the age of the child. So 
how to use forebrain in speech and language therapy sessions. We're going to go into some of the strategies, but firstly, just wanted to remind you, it's a complementary tool. We're using it alongside our other evidence-based practices that we already do as therapists. And we're just going to basically do what we're already doing, but just using forebrain. There's really nothing secret or magical to it. We're just using something alongside the things that we're already doing. So the first kind of strategy I'm going to talk about today is vocal play. And I love vocal play. I think it's so, so fun, especially with our kids with language delay. It can just be such a nice step in between kind of babbling or maybe vocalizing and first words. So I have this one little boy that I, I work with. His name is Theodore. And when I began working with him, he was two years old. He was babbling. He was vocalizing. He didn't have any words yet. He would make a lot of facial expressions. So you could see he was kind of wanting to communicate, but just not quite ready to take that step to using words just yet. Um, and he was really, really cheeky. He kind of always wanted to be doing the things that he really wasn't meant to be doing in sessions. I see him in his house, so he, he knows his house pretty well. So it was winter time and they had the heaters on and he knew he's not meant to touch the heater, but he just kept wanting to go over and touch it just to get the reaction of no, don't do that. And so instead of making it into this battle, I didn't want that. I just decided to make it into a game and to incorporate some vocal play. So what I would do is I would go up, I would pretend to touch the heater, but not actually touch it, pretend to touch it and then pull my hand away and gasp really loudly, make a big facial expression. And then maybe, blow my fingers, maybe say, ouch, something like that. He thought this was hilarious. And so straight away, he wanted to do it too. He would pretend to touch the heater, pull his hand away and gasp, and then blow on his finger. And it was just great. It was the first activity where he really started to use vocal play by just even just by gasping at this point. And so each week I would go and see him and he just really loved this game. He wanted to keep playing it. So we would do a little bit each session and then I could see it was really evolving. He started off just, just by gasping when he'd pull his hand away. And then eventually he added in and ouch like this. I was like, oh, that's so great. That's kind of the next step of vocal play. It's maybe closer to a word. And then after a few weeks, so he's bilingual French and English. So after a few weeks, uh, he pulled his hand away and he goes, show, which means hot in French. I was so, so happy. It was one of the first words that he used was this word show. And it was just through this game that we had been playing. So he had, he had been using the vocal play of gasping, of saying ouch. And then eventually when he was comfortable, he put in a little word, he put in show or hot in French. So it's just a nice way to demonstrate how vocal play really can lead towards speech. So like I said, it's a step towards first words. We're just using fun and playful noises. It's exactly what it says it is. And it can help the child to become interested in their own voice. We can also use big facial expressions and an excited voice like you saw in my story. And we can also play with loud and quiet noises. So another type of vocal play I love to do, I love to have my little baby doll. We have this kind of blanket thing. It's just a face cloth, but we use it as a blanket. And we'll put baby to sleep. So we'll say, good night, baby. We'll put our blanket on and we'll go, shh, baby sleeping, shh, be quiet. So playing with quiet noises. And then we'll make a big loud noise to wake baby up, like wah, and wake baby up. And this is a super fun one for kids to do too. They think it's really silly. The thing when we're doing vocal play, we want to remember that we're not putting on a show for the child. We want to give them a chance and enough space to try it for themselves. So it's not just us making lots of fun, loud vocal play and the child giggling at us. It's really interactive. We're doing it together. We're pausing and letting them have a chance to try it out for themselves. So when we're doing vocal play, it's very simple. We're just wearing the forebrain or the child is wearing the forebrain and that's great. Um, when I think about vocal play, I think about kind of three main types of vocal play. So the first one is animal noises, maybe jungle animals, farm animals, or domestic animals. So for this type of vocal play, I usually like to pretend to be the animal with the child. And this is another way that forebrain is really great because, I mean, we've seen it's wireless. So it means we can move around without it falling off or going in the wrong position. It's really, really stays on really, really well. So we can pretend to be stomping elephants or swinging our arms like monkeys jumping all around and it will stay on no problem. Um, we can also use little toys if we want to. That's no problem as well for animal noises. The next kind of vocal play that I like to think of is um, cars, trains and planes or those kind of transport noises, which are really fun. So things like beep beep or choo 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 for a train, um, vroom for like a motorbike or um, like a for an airplane. 
So for these noises, I do usually use them alongside toys, but again, you could pretend to be the car, be the train, or be the airplane with vocal play. And then the last type I think of um, is like general exclamation noises. And these ones may be a little bit closer to words, or some may even argue that they are first words, but they're still kind of playing with our voices. So they might be things like if something goes wrong, it might be something like, uh oh, or oh no, or oops, or something like that. Ouch, like we saw in our story with Theodore. Um, if we're excited about something, it might be yay, or wow, or something like that. And then uh, if we're playing with a block tower and it crashes, it might be something like boom. Or if we're playing with bubbles, it might be something like pop, 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 pop. So those are all different types of vocal play. We can use all of them while we're wearing our forebrain. For the next thing we're going to talk about, it's going to be pretend play. So for me, pretend play is child-led play for the most part. It can be using objects and toys, or it could be completely imaginary. We could just be pretending things. And when we're using pretend play, we want to make sure that we're choosing our language targets really carefully, especially for speech and language therapists. So we're wanting to have a really nice mix of nouns, verbs, and adjectives. And we're wanting to, if possible, we're wanting to kind of avoid shapes, colors, letters, and numbers. And this is purely because if we're working with children with language delay, these kind of like academic words like shapes, colors, letters, and numbers, they're just less functional if we don't have that many words to begin with. Um, the reason we want to include nouns, verbs, and adjectives is because if we, the tendency seems to be to have like a lot, a lot of nouns and kind of skimp on the verbs and adjectives, but that just becomes problematic when we're moving from like single words to maybe making two word phrases or three word phrases, because we really need a mix to be able to make phrases. Basically, um, if we're wanting to make a phrase, and we only have nouns, the only types of phrase that we can make are these possessive phrases like mommy's sock or daddy's cake, you know, two nouns together, it just makes a possessive phrase. Whereas if we have verbs and adjectives, we can make different types of phrases as well. So with pretend play, uh, these are my evidence-based strategies that I use. I love using Hannon strategies, the It Takes Two to Talk program. I think that's a really, really great one for kids with language delay. Um, observe, wait, listen, say less, stress, go slow, show for introducing new words, and then repeat, which leads us nicely into using focused language stimulation. So focused language stimulation is just where we're modeling language. So we're modeling our target words and we're modeling them at a high frequency. And there is a little bit of debate about what constitutes a high frequency. But for me, I would say like five to 10 repetitions within like one to two minutes in an activity of my target word. So if we have the forebrain for focused language stimulation, obviously with focused language stimulation, we're just modeling. There is not actually pressure on the child to, to speak or to, to, imitate the target word that we're using, even though that does usually end up happening. It's not the goal of focused language stimulation. The goal is just for us to model the target words. So we're gonna have the child seated to our left. They're gonna be wearing the forebrain and then we're gonna turn the microphone towards us. So what this means is that my voice is going into the microphone and they're having just a slightly louder, more um, emphasized version of the target words that I'm already modeling. If then we stop doing focused language stimulation, we can just simply turn the microphone back towards the child. So here are some of my favorite pretend play activities. Uh, I don't need to go through them all. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. I love having the baby doll, obviously. I think we can do so many things with this. Um, I already showed you the going to sleep one. We can feed it, we can change it, we can make it do different things. And I find both boys and girls really love having a little baby doll to play with. Um, another one that I really enjoy is the firefighter. I think this is a really fun one. It's one that doesn't involve um, so many toys. It's much more imaginary. We pretend to be firefighters. We might use our hands as a hose. Um, and then maybe the only toy that we use is like something to represent a fire, maybe like a color, like a red block or a piece of Lego or something. So I love to, um, we might take turns hiding the fire somewhere in the room. And then we'll use our vocal play to be a fire engine, like a pow, 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 rush in and try and find the fire. So I love this because it gives us a chance to work on vocal play, be the fire engine noise. And then also it gives us a chance to work on maybe locations around the room. So like on the chair, on the table, on the TV, um, next to the toy box, whatever. And then if our children are at the level of uh, learning prepositions, we can also work on prepositions. So is it, 
on the chair or is it under the chair or is it beside the couch or is it behind the couch? So it's just a really nice versatile activity that we can kind of use with children with language delay who have all levels of, of language. Oh, just asterisks there for dressing up. If we are using the forebrain and we're dressing up, just have to be a little bit mindful that the thing at the back makes it a little bit difficult to wear hats or helmets or masks, but we can still wear capes or anything on the body, dresses, shoes, gloves, whatever. Just on the head, it's a little bit difficult if we're wearing the forebrain. All right, the next type of game we're going to be talking about are structured games. These are real classics in speech and language therapy. So these are just more structured, like what they say they are. Um, they usually involve turn taking. They might have more rules than pretend play. So they might be a little bit less child led and they might have an ultimate goal. So you can see here, I'm playing with Josie. We're playing monkeying around. So we've got monkeys on the tree. The goal is to hang the monkeys on the tree and the game finishes when they crash down into the crocodile pond. Uh, they might be games that have like kind of an action and consequence element. So something like pop up pirate or we push the sword into the barrel and the pirate pops up. And we're just going to be using the same strategies as with pretend play. So we're using our hand strategies, we're using focus language stimulation, and then in terms of the forebrain, we're going to, again, be either turning it towards ourself if we're modeling language, or we're going to be having it pointing towards the child if they're using a bit more language spontaneously. Here are some of my favorite structure games. Pop Up Pirate is an absolute classic. It was my first game that I purchased when I, uh, when I went into private practice. Mr. Potato Head, uh, Ruff's House. This one actually I, I got introduced to last year by my occupational therapist friend and I just love it. It's a really, really good game. It's like a little dog's house that has a rubber door and you can put your hand inside and there's all these bones inside and the bones are all like different colors, different textures, different kind of, um, like soft or hard or fluffy or spiky or dotty or there are lots of different things. So it's a really nice one for working on adjectives with children. Has a little puppy as well so we can make the puppy eat the bones when we pull them out. Uh, monkeying around like we saw with Josie in the last slide and then Crocodile Dentist like I'm playing here with Aiden and I actually hate this game Crocodile Dentist. I find it terrifying. I found it terrifying when I was a kid. I still don't like it as a therapist but for kids who are adrenaline junkies it is a really good one to use so I'll suck it up and I'll use it with them <laughs> even though I don't like it myself. For kids who have a little bit more language or who are maybe a little bit older, I would say three, three and a half and up, we can use Orchard Toys games as well. Um, it's a British brand, but I think you can find it mostly on Amazon. They're really, really good for, um, for, for language, for children with language delay. So I love the ones that are like Shopping Cart or Tummy Ache, Crazy Chefs, and Where Do I Live? So they're games that do require children to have a little bit of ability to kind of sit and focus and concentrate. Um, but the, the language that they provide in the games is just really, really nice. Read books. I've already talked about reading books and it is something that I like to do in most sessions. Um, if we're talking about using the forebrain while we're reading books, we're gonna want to do it if the child already likes books. If the child doesn't already show an interest in books, then it's not the best activity to use the forebrain with. It's not worth the battle. Um, the types of books that I do like to use for a language delay, I love Lift the Flat Books. I have a couple of mine here today. I've got so many. So I've got Spot's Birthday Party and Spot Goes to the Farm. And the reason I love these is because uh, it kind of makes this exciting element of like having a little flat to lift up, like the spot goes to the farm one, there's all the animals behind the door. So, oh my goodness, who's behind the door? Let's see. And then we can also add in some vocal play by knocking on the door each time, like knock, knock, knock. <gasps> who's there? Let's open. And then we open. <gasps> it's a cow. Hi, cow. Um, we can also add in some verbal routines. So we might say goodbye to everything before we close the flap. So like, bye, cow and then we close the flap, move on to the next page, and repeat, we're gonna knock again. Um, for ones that don't have doors, we can also do like a peekaboo for the vocal play. So this one is Spot's birthday party. I love Spot books, they're so great. This one is Spot's birthday party, playing hide and seek. And the first one is someone under a blanket. So we can't knock on a blanket, obviously, but we can go peekaboo. So we might go peek We could wait for the child to say boo, or we could just model it, boo. And then we see the crocodile. Oh my goodness, there's a crocodile under the blanket. And again, we can say, bye crocodile, and move on to the next page. 
I also love books with vocal play opportunities like you just saw with those two. Um, doesn't have to be lift to flat books. Other books have vocal play opportunities as well. Books with animals, books with cars, books with, um, oh, like this one here, blue hat, green hat. This is a really nice one too. This one has an oops on each page. So blue hat, green hat, red hat, oops on every page. That's a nice one for vocal play. Books with repetition. Um, one of my favorite books with repetition, I think, is that we're going on a bear hunt book. This one, every page is exactly the same. There's just one little part on each, on each page that is different. So every single page goes, we're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. I'm not scared. That's the same on every page. And then what changes is just the thing that we encounter. So like, uh-oh, a river, a deep, cold river. That's the only thing that's different. And then uh, once the children have heard the book a few times, the next part is what they like to fill in. So it goes, we can't go over it. We can't go under it. We'll have to go through it. And then we get to splash through the river or squish through the mud or go through the snowstorm or whatever. So books with repetition are really good, especially for kids with language delay, because it just gives us so many opportunities to hear the same words over and over, to understand them, and then maybe even to produce them once we're familiar with the book a little bit. And then books with rhyme. Um, rhyme is a nice early phonological awareness skill to kind of sneak in nice and early, um, because we know phonological awareness skills are really important for literacy later on down the line. So it's just a nice way of kind of sneaking in some phonological awareness right nice and early. If we're having the child wearing the foreground while we're using books, again, we're going to have them seated on our left. So just like this, just like before, a little baby with our microphone. Voila. So seated on our left, if we are reading, we can turn the microphone towards us. If the child knows the book, if it's one with repetition that they're familiar with, or if it's one that they're using vocal play with, we might have it turned towards them. So can I give you an example with my blue hat, green hat? If you don't know this book, this is a super fun one. It's about a turkey who's trying to get dressed, but he keeps putting his clothes on the wrong body parts. So it's a great one for um, using really functional vocabulary, body parts and clothing. And then it also has this vocal play on each page with oops every time the turkey puts his hat on the wrong place or his shoes on the wrong place or whatever it is. So if I'm doing this book with my baby, I need to have honestly more arms to be doing this activity, but that's okay. If I'm doing this book with my baby, the baby knows this book, it's repetitive, the baby's done this book before, so I know that the baby's gonna fill in the oops. So I'm gonna leave the microphone to turn towards the baby's now for this one. So I'm gonna go, oh, blue hat, green hat, red hat. And then I'm gonna wait expectantly for my oops, and then the baby's gonna fill in, oops. I'm gonna say, oh no, turkey, you put your hat on your feet. And then we're gonna go to the next page. So that's just what I said. Turn the microphone towards the therapist when reading or turn the microphone towards the child if there's a part of the book that they can do independently. Here are my book recommendations. I already talked about most of these. So Spot's birthday party, Spot goes to the farm. Honestly, basically any Spot lift the flat book, they're all pretty great. Dear Zoo is another classic, another classic lift the flat book. Um, where is the green sheep? I think maybe speech therapists from Australia and New Zealand might be more familiar with this one, but it's a really good book for working on adjectives. Blue hat, green hat, like we saw, and we're going on a bear hunt. Those are my favorite ones for using in therapy. Little tip, um, I think most of you are probably living in the countries that do speak your language, but if you don't, I live in France, so it's hard for me to get books in English. So I either buy them secondhand or from the book depository because it ships uh, online, uh, it ships worldwide, sorry, for free. It's a really nice way to get books. The next thing we're going to talk about is singing songs and nursery rhymes. So I love this channel on YouTube called Super Simple Songs. They have excellent songs to use with children with language delay. Um, basically, this channel was designed, I think, originally for children who were learning English as their second language. So the way that they made their songs was just to have them kind of slow down, simplify the language, and repeat the target words more, which is exactly what we need to do with children with language delay. So it's a really nice resource for us as therapists would say it is better to sing in real life if we're in therapy than to watch it on YouTube and that is purely because it's more interactive. We can speed the song up, we can slow it down to make it more fun, we can pause if we're wanting the child to fill in a little bit. We can't do that with YouTube so 
some children, they will only be motivated if you're watching it on YouTube. So you could maybe watch it the first time on YouTube together. And then once they know the song, you could do it together in therapy, just face to face without using YouTube. Um, I like to choose songs with gestures. So gestures similar to vocal play can be a really nice step in between not using words and using words. Um, they also something that we can prompt for children who have language delay, who don't quite understand that we're requiring something from them when we're pausing and waiting expectantly. Um, if we pause and wait expectantly in a song, so for like um, the wheels on the bus go round and round, and then we pause, wait for the child to fill in the next round and round, if the child's not filling it in, we can help them if we have the gestures by taking their hands and helping them to do the round and round gesture. For singing songs and nursery rhymes, again, we can either have the microphone turned towards us, the therapist, if we're singing and the child doesn't maybe know the song very well yet, but I find most kids like to kind of sing into the microphone, whether they're singing the real words or whether they're just kind of babbling and vocalizing. A lot of them, if we're singing, do like to sing in the microphone by themselves. So I mostly just leave the microphone turned towards the child for singing songs and nursery rhymes. Pause and wait expectantly, like we said, and turn the microphone towards the child if they're filling in the words or the vocalizations. The other thing that's really great, we already talked about it with the vocal play, is the fact that the forebrain is wireless. So we can move around a lot when we're singing songs and nursery rhymes. We can do like one little monkey jumping on the bed, we can jump, we can crash while we're in the forebrain. We could do like a ring around a rosy where we're running in circles and then again crashing while we're in the forebrain. I just, I love that it's wireless. It makes it so nice to use in therapy. We don't have to sit and stay in one place. We can really move about freely. Here are my song, uh, nursery rhymes and song recommendations. So wheels on the bus, like we talked about, if you're happy and super simple do a really nice version of if you're happy. Um, instead of going, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, they simplify it and they just say, if you're happy, 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 clap your hands. So we just get happy, happy, happy three times instead of if you're happy and you know it. And then the part in the middle of the song, which is, if you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it instead of all of that language which is maybe a little bit too much for a child with language delay they just repeat our target words so they say if you're happy 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 clap your hands clap your hands so that's a really nice example of how super simple songs simplify your songs and nursery rhymes i love it old mcdonald one little monkey like we talked about happy birthday is another really fun one heads shoulders knees and toes one little finger open shut them i think one little finger and open shut them might be songs that are only available on super simple songs they might have written those ones i'm not sure and then i will even use baby shark i know it's a horrible earworm of a song but if it's what a child is motivated by then we're going to use it in therapy we're going to do everything we can to keep the child motivated and interested in therapy so it's important to keep it fun and it's important to mix it up. And that goes with whatever population we're working with. We need to keep it fun. We need to mix it up. Um, we might be using the forebrain for one session reading a book. The next session, even though we may have the same language goals, we might use it for singing songs or we might use it for playing with a toy or something different. We don't have to be doing the same thing every single session. So if a family has forebrain at home, this is pretty rare, but I have had families that will uh, purchase a forebrain and have one at home. The most important thing is to make sure that they know what they're aiming for. So make sure that they're aware if it's 10 or 15 minutes a day that they should be shooting for. Um, I also like to use a sticker chart for families, and this is not just for the child. It acts as also a visual reminder for the parents just to remember to use their forebrain because it can sometimes be difficult to remember and just having the added visual can help us to remember. I like to give them one goal per week to work on. So something really specific that they know they should be doing for that week. We're going to be using activities that involve language. Obviously, we're not just going to be wearing the forebrain for 10 minutes while nobody's speaking. That's completely pointless. And for families, I like to just recommend that they use it during daily living activities. So similar, similarly with us, with therapists, that we just do what we're already doing in therapy, but just use the forebrain. We want the family to just be doing what they're doing already, but using the forebrain. So some of the activities I recommend that they use it with might be reading together before bedtime, getting dressed, playing together, or even just doing chores like cleaning up the toys or folding the clothes or cooking. And of course, I am recommending um, other language strategies for my parents to be using with their children. I'm not just saying, here's the four ring, go for it. I also do set them up with other language strategies to use. 
but I'm going to give them one really specific goal. I'll be like, okay, this week I want every night at bedtime that you wear the forebrain for 10 minutes while you read books together. So that might be my specific goal for the week. And then they know the language strategies that they should be using at that time as well. So after using forebrain for two and a half years, here are the things I have observed. So increased interest and awareness in their own voice. What you often see, which is so curious, it's really funny every time I see it, a child will put the forebrain on for the first time, they'll go like this, and then they'll start doing and just they're completely elsewhere they're just in their own head listening to their own voice so curious about their own voice they could be doing it with words most of the time they do it with babbling and they kind of practice different sounds but just this complete concentration and listening to their own voice i love it i really enjoy seeing that so of course increased vocalizations like i just mentioned increased babbling like i just mentioned increased vocal play like i just mentioned those three things also increased motivation to participate because they love how they look when they wear it. And some kids really enjoy the feel of it. Some kids don't like the feel of it so much, but some kids really enjoy having that kind of loud input in their ears. They're much more motivated to participate. And then increased focus and engagement in activities. There's something really like grounding and kind of helps them to focus and concentrate when you have this really strong input into your ears. So these are the things I've observed instantly. The, the things that are harder to measure over time are obviously um, like does it lead to words. I think it's harder to say because I use so many language strategies that lead to words and it's like a lot longer process so I think it definitely does help but it's just more difficult to say yes it definitely does this whereas these things here are the things that you can kind of see instantly straight away this is what you see. So I'm going to take your questions now. Let me just pop out of this um, share screen, stop my share, and I'm gonna to get to your questions. So I'm gonna check the ones in the Q&A first. So is the dynamic filter filtering out a specific frequency range? Yes, it is, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I know it is the range for where speech sounds fall. So it is in the speech sound range. I hope that answers your question. I'm going to put it under dismiss. If I didn't answer it, you can pop it up again. Um, is forebrain mainly for speech therapy? What about changing behavior or healing brain injuries? So I use it for speech therapy because I'm a speech and language therapist, but I think it is designed to be used across all professionals who work with, with anybody, basically. Um, you could get more information about your specific population, who I'm not super familiar with, maybe on the forebrain website. I dismiss that one. Okay, another comment about the frequency filtering. Does it actually emphasize certain frequencies in the speech itself? I don't know about voice pro. I'm not sure what that is, sorry, and how it's different from forebrain. So I, I can't help you with that one. Sorry about that. Um, but it does emphasize certain frequencies in the speech itself. So any any range of the that's in this zone of where we speak are emphasized by this by this dynamic speech filter. It's really curious. I do suggest that you try one on yourself. Um, I'm sure you could find somewhere in your area that would have these available that you could just try on and experience it for yourself. It's a really, really strange sensation to hear your voice just loudly because you really don't hear any of the background noises more loudly. You only hear your voice more loudly. It's really, really unusual. What are the benefits from using forebrain during language stimulation? Improvement is faster. Does the forebrain, does forebrain has to be soft to show improvement? Can it be done at home by, okay, there's a bunch of questions here. So benefits of using forebrain during language stimulation. It's just with language stimulation, we're modeling language and with forebrain, it's just emphasizing our model. So it's just an even more kind of salient version of what we're already doing. Um, does forebrain have to be used often to show improvement? I think Yes, ideally every day for 10 minutes. Um, but even like I mentioned, you can even see improvement in one session. The kids who I work once a week with who don't have forebrain um, outside of therapy, as soon as we put the forebrain on, we do notice those things that I was mentioning. So we do notice increased babbling, increased vocalizations, increased vocal play, increased motivation, etc. Can it be done at home by a parent? Absolutely, yes. How long does it take to finish? I'm not sure if I know what you mean by that. You could maybe elaborate a little bit. 
What about older children still language delayed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't work with that population as much, but you definitely could use Forebrain to work with them. So the youngest age of child that I've used it on, any tips for better fit on little ones? I did have this question yesterday when I did the webinar. So the youngest age that I've used it on is a two year old. And this is purely like you mentioned because the fit of the headset is a little bit tricky for kids under two because their heads are just too small. Someone did mention though, I didn't know this, so I haven't tried it out. You can try it for yourself. Um, if you put a beanie on on top of it, for kids who have a little bit of a smaller head, um, that it can help with getting the forebrain to stay on for younger ones. And I feel like, I need to find this out for sure, but I heard a rumor that there maybe is gonna be a smaller version released for younger children with a smaller headset or a more adjustable headset. Maybe it's that, maybe it's more adjustable. I need to find out and get back to you because I have heard a rumor about that. Is there a certification training required to use forebrain? No, there is a certification training required to be a tomatis therapist, which is kind of, um, tomatis is like the big listening program and then forebrain is kind of a product that came off from this um, listening program, but you don't have to be uh, certified to use forebrain. You can buy one for yourself and you can just use it. There is an instruction manual and stuff in the, in the forebrain little box here. It does come with a little manual on how to use it. The one thing I will say is that in the manual, it recommends a certain posture and that's just, you don't need to do it. You can move around and you can use it. The manual um, was based on like very strict tomatoes methods where you do have to have this posture, but if we're using it in therapy, then we don't need to use that posture. Have I had any success using forebrain with fluency disorders? That's a really interesting question. I don't work with fluency, so I can't say, but I know that delayed auditory feedback devices are used in fluency disorders. So it is a question that I have, and I don't know the answer. If you would like to use it with um, someone with a fluency disorder and get back to me, I would love to know. Um, it's not a population that I work with, I'm sorry. Okay, how could you? used to approach stu okay stuttering again i'm sorry i don't work with stuttering not my field of uh practice will there be a webinar for motor speech disorders so i'm going to kind of include them in my speech sound disorders webinar so it's going to be the next one you'll receive an email if you if you're on the uh the sound for life mail list um it's not going to be specifically about children with apraxia but i will talk about kind of motor speech disorder in that seminar because I have had kids with apraxia who I've used it with. One more question. Um, turn the mic towards the trainer in some of the exercises. This doesn't seem to help directly with these. Okay, yes. So it doesn't help with the user's own voice audio loop. You're correct. It helps because they're gonna be, if we're speech therapists, modeling language, it just makes our targets, the words that we're modeling, more salient, more present, more kind of easy to pick up for the listener. So we're, we're just targeting a completely different thing. We're not working on the user's own voice audio loop, like you say, we're just targeting something completely different. Do I rent my device to parents or expect to purchase them? I don't rent my one, but I do lend it to parents sometimes. Um, the thing with Forebrain, they're very, very sturdy, like shockingly sturdy. I've had a kid stomp on, like not on purpose, but stomp on it. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's broken forever. And it was totally fine, like no problems. I've had like kids chew on it or like rip it off their heads and like stretch it in a crazy way. And it just, it doesn't break. So I do lend it to families. Um, and then the clinic that I work out of, I rent clinic space out of a tomatoes clinic called the Sensory Center, and they will hire out the four brains to their families. They have a whole big stack of four brains, whereas I only have one as a therapist. So I will lend mine to families from time to time, especially if I'm going on vacation, I might lend it for two weeks to a family if I'm going away. Um, but some clinics will hire them out. When do you stop using Forbrain? Well, when you, when you want to, when you feel like it's not beneficial anymore. I think that's the answer. Have you noticed any changes in auditory processing in elementary school age kids? Uh, that is not a population that I work with so much. I think there is research on this. You could check on the Forbrain website. I know there is a bunch of research because I know event, um, originally it was used a lot more in those kind of populations for like reading and auditory processing and using it with younger children is a little bit newer. So I encourage you to check on the Forbrain website to see if there's any research done on auditory processing. All right. 
oh, how to help those who are reluctant to wear the device, any tips? I did talk about that a lot earlier. You wrote your question at 11.43. So I think I mentioned that like right at the start of the webinar. Um, just quickly, um, I would say just take your time, basically. Um, take turns, just make it fun and exciting and non-threatening is the best way that you can um, yeah, that you can get a child who's sensitive. If, oh, I didn't mention that you can also practice wearing it, but having it turned off. So you can have it turned on and off. It's on when the blue light's on. And you can also adjust the volume. There's like a louder and quieter. So if kids are really hypersensitive, I would just get used to having it like sit on your ear first. And then um, once they're used to that sensation and fine with that, then you might turn it on, but keep it at a lower volume. Um, and then as they get used to it, you could slowly turn it up. If you wanted more information, um, the webinar will be sent to everyone. I don't think it's gonna be sent tomorrow because the person who is in charge of sending out the webinars and things is on holiday, but it will be sent to everyone next week. So if you want to just rewatch the part where I talk about working with kids who are a little bit more sensitive, um, it should be about, I think, like maybe 10, 15 minutes into the webinar. So you can watch that when they send you the link. What is the cost of the device? I'm not sure what your currency is. I'm in euros. I think it's around 300 euros. You can get deals online. If you, uh, this is a bit sneaky, maybe I shouldn't tell you, <laughs> but you can get deals. If you Google like for, um, for brand and you're looking for buying one, you will get ads pop up that advertise having 10% off like on Facebook or something. So maybe Google it, see, see um, if you want to buy it and then maybe wait for some ads to pop up and give you a 10% discount code. They do have those codes available quite often. And then once a year, um, I got mine at Christmas time when I had this discount, they will do like a 30% discount, which is really, really nice. So I ended up paying like maybe 210 euros or something for mine instead of 300. So that was a really, really nice way of doing it. Once a year, they will do a 30% discount code. I think it's normally around Christmas time, so it's a little bit far away, but you also can get sometimes the 10% discount code. Have I noticed any changes in reading and intimidation with elementary school ages? I don't, I haven't worked specifically with that. I have worked with Forebrain with working with dyslexia and I've noticed the kids who I work with who have dyslexia often have like issues with concentration as well. Like they'll be reading and then just get distracted really easily. And I've noticed that when they're wearing the Forebrain, they're much more likely to kind of stay on task when they're reading. So that's the difference that I've noticed for dyslexia. Um, also like reading a little bit more fluently, but that's kind of hard to hard to quantify how fluently they're reading. In terms of uh, reading in a monotone voice, that's not something that I've worked with, so I can't say yes or no, but you could definitely test it out and see if it would work. Can we receive the recording of the session? Yes. So um, I just mentioned the the person who is in charge of like the technology admin side of the webinars is on holiday at the moment. So I think the email from this session will go out next week once she's back. Oh, someone says, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> And would you explain more about the effect of the voice audio loop? I work with kids with Down syndrome. Does Forebrain help kids with more clear pronunciation? Okay, so the voice audio loop is just basically how you hear your own voice and that, that loop of being able to kind of correct your own voice and, and change how you say things. Um, it's really, really curious. I think your question is going to maybe be a bit better answered in the next webinar where I talk about speech sound disorders because that's talking about pronunciation but the short answer is yes it can definitely help with pronunciation because it really does increase your awareness of how your own voice is sounding and it can enable you to make changes. All right I'm going to check the questions in the chat if you will bear with me. Oh my goodness there's a few. Okay. Okay someone's wanting me to show the headset position. I'll just show it one more time. So we put it on our ears. It goes around the back of your head on the bone here, on the bone on both sides. And then the microphone just comes and sits in front of your mouth. Very easy. Um, is it not good to use forebrain all the time? Do you know, I'm not actually sure. I'm not sure why the recommendation is for 10 or 15 minutes, but I know it's the recommendation for a reason. So I follow the recommendation. Um, I need to maybe look into it and find a little bit more out myself. I haven't asked myself that question, but I should find out and get back to you. I believe you can, someone says they can buy it and try it for 30 days and return it if you don't like it. I'm not sure about that. Maybe it's possible. I haven't heard of that, but it's possible. Um, Forebrain amplifies high frequency sounds that says shh. 
I would say yes, yes, it does. And yes, former can definitely use with children who have tubes because it just completely bypasses this ear part altogether. You're just using bone conduction and stimulating your auditory nerve directly. So it's just completely bypassing that middle part of the ear. We're not using air conduction at all. So it could be actually really great for children who have tubes. Um, any more for autistic child or hyperactive one? Yes, that will be my third webinar. We'll be talking about using forebrain with children with autism. Um, it is a population that I use forebrain with, and especially children with hyperactivity. I've seen lots of nice progress of them kind of calming down and more concentrated. But we will talk about that more in two webinars time. Um, what age is the best target age to use forebrain? Like I said, I would say from two up just because of the size of the forebrain. So from two years onwards, I had uh, people in the webinar I did yesterday talking about using it with stroke patients. So people in their 60s and 70s, you really can use it with people of all ages. Um, can we receive the cording? Yes. Oh, someone says yes, forebrain does help with auditory processing disorder. So thank you for your answer. Is it good for cerebral palsy? That's also not a population that I really work with because I'm mostly working with um, like speech and language and I don't really work with cerebral palsy. My colleague who is an occupational therapist does work with using forebrain and she does work with children who have cerebral palsy. So she might be a better one to ask that question too. Um, let me just think, she, she does do webinars periodically. I'm not sure if she's doing forebrain ones at the moment, but just keep an eye out. She's an occupational therapist. So if there is an occupational therapist doing a webinar on forebrain, then I recommend signing up and asking your question about cerebral palsy to her. Oh, someone says there's a sale right now. They said, I can send you a code for 30% off in the next three days. Excellent, very nice. Um, someone says info at brainsolutionsinc.com. Not sure what that's for. Is there Turkish menu? Oh, I have no idea. No idea if there's a Turkish menu in it. Um, the, my one here, I mean, I ordered mine from France. Let me see. Mine's got the English user's manual. Oh my goodness, it's gonna have so many languages. I won't even know how, what they are. We've got French, English, Spanish, and Dutch or maybe German. And then on the back, Polish, uh, Korean, I think Chinese, and some other language that uses symbols. I don't see Turkish here. Um, I don't know if you speak any of those other languages. You could always look online and see if there's one available on the Fortbrain website. Um, okay, someone's answering the question about the overuse. They said you should not overuse it. It can be too much for your brain. That kind of does make sense because it is a lot. It's really, you will see if you try it on, it's a lot. It's very, it can be overwhelming even. Like I, when I first put it on, I was like, oh, I don't know if I like this sensation. It's a really weird sensation. Um, do you find benefit for those with glue ear? Yes, I really do. I work with a lot of kids with speech sound disorders. So I kind of put my kids with glue ear under that category because they often have um, kind of disordered articulation or disordered speech. And yes, I do find that it works for that population. When is the goal to stop using forebrain? Like I mentioned, the goal is just when you feel like you've, you've reached your, your, what you're aiming for, when you've had enough of forebrain, you can just stop. There is no um, specific goal to stop. I work with children with CP and have had great, okay, someone's saying they work with children with cerebral palsy and have had great results with forebrain. So thank you so much for your feedback. Um, oh, the email is for the code and the discount. Well, maybe if the person who has the code and the discount, you could send the, your email to info at brainsolutions.com. Oh, one more in the questions and answers. Okay, at ASHA, the demonstrator said to limit to 10 minutes until they can build up tolerance. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that comment. All right, one more message. Okay, someone says, I've been using a forebrain for two years myself and I can use it up for up to an hour, no problem. So yeah, I'm not sure what the, the time recommendations are for adults. My recommendations were for children, so the 10 minutes and 50 minutes, those are just the ones that are recommended by Sound for Life. Um, as an adult, I don't know, so very good. All right, I think we're all done. If anyone has any last minute questions, please pop them through. Um, and if you have any questions later on, I think you could send an email through to Sound for Life. And if, um, if they're related to speech therapy, then I'll get back to you. So thank you so much for, is there a difference between hearing aid and forebrain? Yes, completely different. Forebrain and hearing aid are not the same at all. Um, 
Oh, someone's saying thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I know it's a very weird time to, of the world just to be existing at the moment. It's really strange for me. I'm doing a webinar from my bedroom. It feels very unprofessional, but that's okay. Thank you so much for joining and I hope it was useful. I hope it was helpful for you and I'll see you at the next webinar. Bye everybody.